Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to the worship of God here at Westminster. We are glad you're here, and however you found us and wherever you came from, it's good you stopped here this day. Um, in your uh, pew racks, you'll find prayer request cards, and if you have a prayer request, we ask that you fill out one of those cards, and we'll pick those up during the singing of our second hymn. Also in the pew rack, there are visitor cards. If you're a first time visitor, please fill one of those out and place it in the offering plate as the offering is taken. We do have some announcements today. Uh, announcement people, would you come forward at this time? Good morning. I'm making an announcement for the women of Westminster, Presbyterian women. And we've been doing these kits, and I have a feeling that some of you out there don't really understand what they are or what they're for. We've done them for a number of years, and ours go to the Presbytery and then get shipped on. But this is a church world service project. So churches from all over the United States are putting these together, men's groups, women's groups. Sometimes the children do the school bags. And by the way, Carolyn Anderson, thank you for making all those school bags for us. Thank you. Uh, these will go to the Presbytery. The Presbytery will send them to Maryland, where the Mennonite Church has a warehouse, and they store these. They go through them once again to make sure everything's correct, and then they get stored. Now, we have a hurricane going on. And the people in New Bern, North Carolina, did not think they were gonna get hit. Well, they did. So they got saved from their houses with their clothes on and probably a phone and their wallet, and that's it. They get to a shelter. Someone will hand them one of these kits. It has a washcloth a towel, soap, it will have toothpaste in by then, a toothbrush and a comb. They're set, they can get clean. The buckets are the things, we've done six for a couple years, and we had a project number of 10. And I think we have the six, but we'd like to get the others done. Now these are collected by church agencies. The Presbyterian Church has something called now, Presbyterian <laughs> assistance. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got to get it out. I, I lost it for a minute, Blake. Um, these are people who have been trained. It's usually a two-week train, training, and they get retrained every four years. And I know two guys in Arizona, and they have been called out twice this year to help clean up some of the fires. They have to provide their own transportation and their own tools, et cetera. But they can contact the warehouse in Maryland and send, send us 50 buckets, send us 100 buckets, whatever. And when they're through with the flooding in the Carolinas, they will contact, and probably already have, we need X number of buckets. These buckets have everything in it to clean churches, schools, several houses, everything in them. The buckets cost approximately $46. Uh, I put them together. Somebody owes me some money for what I shopped for. Uh, and the bucket itself is $5, but we had some free buckets here this year. So what we would like is to fill up these other four buckets. And we have some pieces. Some of us are getting together tomorrow morning to go through them. But it's a little much for some people to buy all these pieces, some of things cost five, six dollars just for one bottle of something. So I am suggesting we have a basket on the table out there today. And if you would please donate five, ten, twenty dollars, and I will take that money after we work tomorrow, and I will go do the shopping now that I can shop and walk around the store without any pain. Thank you, God. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Sandy, and this, again, this is the Presbyterian women. Our Presbyterian women of our church have an opportunity to join with the, uh, with the Blackhawk Presbyterian women to volunteer 
the last Saturday of this month, that's September the 29th, in the morning at the Northern Illinois Food Bank. And so that would give you an opportunity to see, if you've not been there, to see what it's all about and how they operate. You'll have a tour of the facility, and then you can assist in uh, uh, stocking the shelves. I understand that Northern Illinois Food Bank will actually be coming here in October. So this gives you a good opportunity to see what goes on behind the scenes. Thank you. Good morning. Next Sunday we have Flapjack Breakfast. Um, hope everyone can come. It's always very good and a great time to have fellowship with everyone. Um, the funds this time will go to the Pastors Fund, which is always in need of some assistance. So please come and join us and have a great time. Again, good morning. Uh, Stephen Ministry Peer Group Supervision will meet again t uh, today, uh, just following the coffee hour. Uh, you might expect it to take a little longer than it has in the last several months because we're going to have some extra reports to uh, deal with today. We're starting to get the money for the crop up. Blake and me are getting money. He's got 50 towards his name already, but we need more money to, to, for him to get a challenge. The walk's on the 14th of the month. There's a, a great song, and it starts out, Who Do You Love? And uh, this is your chance to show your appreciation for me walking. And uh, also, crop walk is one of those great things that really makes a difference for folks around the world. So walk, sponsor, uh, pray from the sidelines, whatever you can do. And that's coming up in October. Let's stand up and greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. Please remain standing if you are able and join me in the call to worship projected on the screens in front of you or printed in your bulletin. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Come into God's presence with singing.
our own humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. Trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion, let us acknowledge who we are and confess our sin before God and one another. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us peace to grow more and more in your likeness and image, through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And all God's people say, these words of assurance. The scriptures teach us of God's compassion. Let us say together what we believe. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Our Lord Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
Hi guys. I thought that maybe today we could play a little game. The game is called Which Thing is Most Powerful? You ready? So let's skip this round. Let's go which animal is most powerful? I have a leopard. I have a crocodile an elephant, and a shark. Which animal is most powerful? Hmm. Wow. Nobody jump all over it. <laughs> what do you think, Lamarvian? You would say the, the shark? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Keyshawn? The alligator, Aiden? The leopard, and Jackson. Good point, good point. So lots of different opinions. I don't know if I have the answer for you. Let's try another one. Which superhero is most powerful? Wonder Woman, Superman, Spider-Man, or The Incredible Hulk? We'll go this way this time. Jackson, what do you think? Superman? I like that you have reasons behind it. Aiden? Spider-Man, Lamarvian? It's not sure, okay, Keyshawn? The Hulk, oh, again, different answers. And guess what? I still don't have a right answer for you. <laughs> then, I want you to think about which part of the body is most powerful. So these are your choices. I have a tongue, I have back muscles, I have leg muscles, and arm muscles. What do you think, Keyshawn? Which muscles? Uh, biceps, yeah, yeah. Those, you can tell on me too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lamarvian, do you think the biceps too? Aiden? The arms? What do you think, Jackson? back muscles. Well, you know what? This time I do have an answer for you. And the answer comes from the Bible. Today in our Bible reading, the book of James, James tells us that the tongue is extremely powerful. And the reason is the tongue can be used in a lot of ways and it can affect other people. So sometimes we use our tongues to do things or say things that bless God. So we say prayers, we sing hymns, we say kind things to others, we encourage others, we tell others about Jesus. And when we do that, our tongue is very powerful because it goes out there and it blesses God. But that same tongue that we use to bless God can also be used to hurt people. So when we do things like say unkind things to people or call people names or tell lies, our tongue is very powerful and it hurts people. And when we do that, it shows disrespect for God. So instead of blessing God or praising God, we're disrespecting him when we treat other people that way and use our tongues to hurt others. So the author, James, he reminds us that before we open our mouths to say anything, we need to think long and hard and make sure that the words that come off our tongue are words that honor God and honor other people. Would you say a prayer with me? Dear God, we thank you for the love and the mercy and the grace that you pour out on us. Help us this week to be especially thoughtful that the words that come from our tongue are those that help and honor and show your love to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us unite in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that, by being taught by you in holy scripture, 
our hearts and minds may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's Old Testament lesson comes from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 through 33. It can be found in the Old Testament portion of your pew Bible on either page 547 or page 552. The Call of Wisdom. Wisdom cries out in the street. In the squares, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded, and because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you, when panic strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way, and be sated with their own devices. For waywardness kills the simple, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure, and will live at ease, without dread of disaster. Our response is Psalm 19, number 3 in your hymnal. Our scripture readings continue as we turn to the New Testament, reading from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. 
Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does the spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives, or a grapevine, figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. And then turning to the Gospel of Mark, we read from chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. If you have a prayer request, we ask that you hold them up so that the ushers can collect them as we sing our next hymn.
You may be seated. Let us pray. Be with us, gracious God, as we come to your word. Help us receive them as words of life for us. May we be transformed by what we hear and live in ways that give you glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In her memoir, a girl named Zippy, Haven Kimmel, talks about growing up in a small town in Indiana. Moreland was a town of 300, and she looked through the census and she discovered it had always been a town of 300. It was 300 in 1930, it was 300 in 1940, it was 300 in 1950, and when she arrived in 1965, it was 300. She figured out that these weren't all the same people, but that some would die and then they would be replaced by new people along the way. And this is what she has to say about her experience of growing up in Moreland. I got to be new there. I was added, and shortly afterward, the barber named Tony was taken away. This was in 1965. The distance between Moreland in 1965 and a city like San Francisco in 1965 is roughly equivalent to the distance starlight must travel before we look up casually from a cornfield and see it. Sociologists and students of history imagine they know something of the United States in the 60s and 70s because they are familiar with the prevailing trends. If they drew assumptions about Moreland based on that knowledge, they would get everything wrong. Strangely, there has never been a definitive source of information about Moreland during a certain 15-year period, perhaps because there are so few people left who can reliably tell it. Many have been added since then. Many have moved on. Not long ago, my sister Melinda shocked me by saying she had always assumed that the book on Moreland had yet to be written because no one sane would be interested in reading it. No, no, wait, she said. I know who might read such a book. A person lying in a hospital bed with no television and no roommate, just lying there, maybe waiting for a physical therapist. And then here comes a candy striper with a squeaky library cart, and on that cart there is only one book, <laughs> or maybe two books, yours and cooking with pork. <laughs> I can see how a person would be grateful for Moreland then. Maybe some of you have experience in small towns and grew up in those places, and you know what they're like. You know how small they can be and also what kind of comfort they can offer and what kind of security they can have. Zippy goes on to talk about growing up, about riding her bike, about going to the drugstore that no longer sold drugs but they still had a soda fountain. And in all these small stories, she finds ways to move ahead, to grow up, and to enjoy a childhood that some people would have thought was just terribly confining. The stories of Jesus' life take place mostly in small towns, backwater, tiny little places, places like Capernaum and Bethsaida, Chorazin, Magdala. They take place in the wilderness, they're just small, little towns along the way that Jesus stops in. And he talks to people in the synagogues there. He visits with his relatives in many cases. And along the way, a story is given to those folks about what God intends for them and for the world. We have 
the sole story of Jesus taking a road trip that wasn't to Jerusalem. He goes up to the region of Caesarea Philippi. And this was the closest thing that was a tourist attraction near where he was doing most of his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. In Caesarea Philippi, there was a regional capital. There was also the center of the religion that was devoted to Pan. There was a great cave there. No one knew where the water source came, but it just ran all the time. And this cave was seen as an entrance to the underworld. And because of this, this was a sign of devotion. It was a place between that world and this world. And Pan was the god of thresholds. And in Roman religion, something happened when you walked through a door. Something changed for you. And in this story, we heard in the gospel, we have something changed for the disciples. Because Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street about who I am? And the disciples come back with various kinds of responses. Well, you're a prophet, you're Elijah back from the dead. Yeah, you're one of those people like that. And then Peter said, you are the Messiah. And this point marks like a hinge in the middle of the book of Mark. Because the first part of Mark is all about Jesus' teachings, his parables, his healings, stories about him going through these small towns, healing and feeding people, talking about the kingdom that's coming. And then after this part in the Gospel of Mark, it's like a race to the crucifixion. And the story turns at this event where Peter recognizes who Jesus is. They step through a threshold and they realize they're not just following another rabbi, but they are following the one that has been sent by God, the one that is anointed to lead people into a new relationship with God. So here they are at this place known for thresholds and they themselves have crossed a threshold. I don't know if they observed any of the rituals associated with religion of Pan while they were there. Um, the one thing is or some of the things we know about the practice of the faith was that um, there was flute playing and that they also had sacred dancing goats as part of their religious services. And I've often thought, you know, I've had my share of tough days in the religion business and I have never had to work with a sacred dancing goat. And so I have to consider myself always blessed by whatever happens today, because there's no goats. But here, here they were in this strange place on a trip, stepping through a threshold, acknowledging who Jesus was and knowing things could never be the same again. So immediately after this, after Peter has had his great insight on who has been sent by God and what Jesus is up to as God's anointed, Jesus starts to tell them some other hard things. He says that I have to undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And how could this make any sense and so Peter says, Lord, what are you saying? Here we've gone through this great awakening as to who you are, and now you're talking about suffering and death. How can that follow on the heels of the triumphant Messiah? And Jesus rebukes Peter in the strongest possible terms. Get behind me, Satan, he says. 
And he says, no, there's a cross and a resurrection ahead for me. There's also a cross and a resurrection ahead for each of us. Each of us daily are dying to those parts that need to be killed off. We are dying to ourselves and we are rising to new life. And sometimes that business of killing off the parts of ourselves that hold us back and drag us down and keep us away from being closer to one another and to God, well, sometimes that's a hard thing to knock off. Our demons can be very persistent sometimes. I think about James, a very practical analysis of how tongues can hurt and how just what we say can be like a fire and how hard it can be to just govern our mouth and just not to hurt somebody else by what we say. But we are dying to ourselves and we are rising to new life. And that is what goes on in our connection with God. God wants to replace those broken, burned out bits of us with abundant life. God wants to take away those things that trip us up and cripple us and keep us from our best self. That resentment, that anger, that bitterness, that disappointment that clings so closely and finally say, that doesn't have to be your future. You can rise again. The flesh can die and the spirit can rise up in new life. Zippy gives this description of Moreland. One woman said that Moreland is a long way to go not to be anywhere when you get there. There was one main street, Broad Street, which was actually not so broad and was the site of the town's only four-way stop sign. There were three churches, the North Christian Church, and the South Christian Church, which sat at opposite ends of Broad Street like Sentinels, and the Moreland Friends Church, which was kind of in the middle of town but tucked back on Jefferson Street at the edge of a meadow. There were no taverns, no theaters, no department stores. If a man was interested in drinking, he had to travel to Mount Summit to the aptly named Dog House or to the package liquor store in Newcastle about 10 miles away. If we think about ourselves, every part of our life can be so familiar to us. All the things that motivate us and drive us, the things that fill our lives or make it empty, the things that shape what we do or don't do, they all look as familiar as a few buildings on a small town main street. But God is at work in all those elements and new life is what God is about. But before we can rise, we have to die. Let's affirm our faith using the words that are found in your bulletin. Let us stand. In life and in death, we belong to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in one kind God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father, in sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. 
ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and their death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. You may be seated. Let us offer our gifts to God.
let us pray. O oh God, the fountain of all good, we bring to you our gifts as you have prospered us. Enable us with our earthly things to give you the love of our heart and the service of our lives. Let thy favor, which is life, and thy loving kindness, which is better than life, be upon us now and always, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south and from east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to you, O God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good and made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us, and even when we turned from you, you remained ever faithful. For these gifts of your love, we thank you, and we join with angels and saints in this joyful hymn of praise. Thank you, O oh God, for sending us your Son. He lived among us and told your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died our death, then rose to new life that we might live and all creation be restored. Great is the mystery of faith. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body for the world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and with one another until we feast with him and with all your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Hear us, gracious God, as we raise these concerns for the congregation. We pray for a woman named Jan who has been diagnosed with stage 4 leukemia, who is undergoing treatments at Northwestern in Chicago. We pray for Alyssa McKnight, who is having surgery on Tuesday to have her gallbladder removed. We hope this restores her to her happy self. We pray for someone named Janie, who has brain cancer, someone named Hisham, who has heart trouble. We pray for a person named Rachel, who is afflicted, afflicted with troubles in her nervous system. 
and also all those affected by the hurricane. There are also prayers for Bev Lane for her continued healing after her hip surgery on this, her 81st birthday. With these concerns in mind and those dear to our hearts, we pray in silence before you now. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power forever. Amen. When Jesus was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took and poured the cup, saying, take and drink. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So that now, whenever we eat and drink at this table, we celebrate Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again.
Friends, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ. 
making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.